Hello and welcome back to Series 6 of The Public Eye, a five-part series of podcasts brought to you by Granite Exchange. As always, I'm your host, Sarah Travers, and throughout this series, I'll be speaking with local entrepreneurs and business owners to learn more about how their companies have come to be, to gain insight into their growth, and find out how they continue to innovate and grow. So wherever you get your podcasts from, remember to keep an eye out for all the new episodes and subscribe to stay up to date. Well, today I am joined by Chris Souter, owner of the Belfast Taylor, co-founder of Souter Coffee, partner of Souter Brothers, DJ and designer of Souter Sisters Bespoke. Wow, lots of businesses there. Chris, you're very welcome to the Public Eye podcast. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's great to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. I know. And you haven't changed one bit. Oh, you haven't yeah. changed. You're still looking gorgeous. Mm, when did you last get the eyes tested? Oh, uh, look here, you know. You know. Yeah, yes, it's always good to start off with a flirt, isn't it, in the morning? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it that much. No, Chris, oh, great. <laughs> Before we begin, though, I'm going to give a little bit of background um, on Chris. So if you don't know already, Chris Souter is, well, I suppose Northern Ireland's best known tailor. He is, as I said, an entrepreneur. He is a DJ, speaker, husband, father, motivator, uh, influencer, and most recently, a trained barista. Yes. My goodness. Yes, you, this you was this brought is, into the coffee. This is thing. Nicola's fault. This is my gorgeous wife, Nicola's fault. Okay, so Nicola, um, Sarah, as you know, is a yoga teacher, Sutra Yoga. And um, she's always wanted to do the coffee thing, as lots of people do. You know, because it's so cool and trendy at the minute. She just wanted to get into coffee. And she did. And I've, I've embraced it with her because she's always backed me in anything that I've ever wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So it was about time that I backed her in her dream. Too right. So... We've both got together. We've opened up a couple of different coffee businesses. We have got fully tra- We we know the crack. One of the things about us, Sarah, as business people and just just as entrepreneurs, we go deep into something. It's not just that can make us money. Let's do that. It's right that can make us money, but let's do it better than mm-hmm. anyone else does. Or let's get really into it. Learn it develop it and be really, really good at it. And so, it is a crowded market at the minute because I suppose yeah. during lockdown, I mean, everybody loved their takeaway oh, coffee. Here, the flipping horse box. Horse boxes popped up everywhere. Oh, wow. So again, for us, we could have done a horse box. We didn't. We bought a really unique little Daihatsu Hijet truck, which is one of one in the world, mm-hmm. created our Souter Coffee truck. It flourished very, very quickly, as most coffee businesses did. And that then led us in, do you know what? We know about this now. We can do a bit of it. Let's do a coffee shop. And as of November, end of November, we opened up our very first coffee shop in Hollywood, County Down, called Suter & Co. Right. And it's flying so far, so... That's, congratulations, so that's far, wonderful. So good. Well, do you know what? Park that thought. I'll come back to the coffee later. Yeah. Um, I just want to, to, to start with with where you started. And I know you've always had that entrepreneurial uh, spirit. You've started um, several businesses yeah. as a very young man. Um, but you eventually bought your way, is that right, into the family tailoring yeah, business? Yeah, that was that, that was something that I kind of fought against for so long. Obviously, being brought up in an entrepreneurial family. Well, tell me about yes. that entrepreneurial so family. So my family, uh, the, the suitor side of the family, dad's side of the family, um, born in Monaghan, grew up in Monaghan on a farm. The typical standard one shoe between three of them, had to walk five miles to school with two potatoes in their pockets to keep warm. You know, all that sort of stuff. And like I, I mean that literally... Dragged up like like with nothing. Is my family, uh, my dad's side, they grew up with nothing, um, and they all whenever they, they moved up north in the mid sixties, and practically all of the all of the seven, um, or sorry, nine of them, sorry, there's nine of them, nine. all of the nine kids have all went on to do really really well, that and right? there's that resilience and that drive to like you know we've had nothing, we don't know. What, you know, we, we know what it's like to have literally nothing. They've all worked. They've all got this epic work, work ethic. It's just to work hard all the time and have a real value of money and what it can do for your life. Isn't that fantastic? And that's obviously filtered down totally. through you. And you know what? Yeah, you know, and I, I could have been spoiled as a kid, but my parents chose not to, you know, and they, it's not that I was, I was, you know, it's, it's not that they, they like, you know, did, didn't get me stuff and all that, you know, but they, they brought me up. What I'm trying to say is they brought me up with a very good relationship with money and the understanding of it and that you have to work. That is the key ethic that they brought in me, myself and my brother from We Were Yay Hats. If you want to get somewhere in life, nobody's out there to give it to you. So you have to just work. And great lessons. But then how did Souter Brothers come about? Right, so yes, so I went to school um, with Grosvenor, um, done pretty well in exams, got a scholarship with Nortel Networks um, at the time, an electronic engineering was so big back then. 
um, went to work for them while I was at school in their technical academy, and then they went bust. While, I, while When they went bust, I opened up my first business while I was at uni, which was a car audio business. I used to fit car stereos back then. <laughs> car stereos were a big thing. That then developed into a car body shop where we were repairing and putting body kits on cars and damage repairable stuff. Um, that i done that for nine years, Sarah, right? So I was spraying cars for nine years. It's like, dude, you, got, you actually hear it in my lungs. I have a, I have a, I have a, con- a lung condition oh, because of it. Yeah, and you could, you? you'll hear me kind of breathing a bit funny, but like, I'm fine. Oh, goodness um, me, right, Yeah, okay. so um, it was killing me, Sarah. And I'll just, I'll tell you straight, the doctor said to me, Chris, if you do another year in this industry, you know, because in, in, that, in that environment, you know, you're surrounded by all these different chemicals. And I used to spray cars with no mask. And I was like, I was real twat, you know. Even you would take on the safety advice. You'd like, you know, it was so busy, just things had to be done. And you're in an environment where there's all these pollutants and irritants and stuff. And it gave me a thing called COPD. Oh, right? my goodness. Yeah, right. Yeah, right? That's very So real. Um, the doc categorically said, Chris, you do another year and you do another two years in this. So how old were you at that point? I was, I left that in 27. So I was from about 17 to about 26, 27 year old. <sighs> Okay, Gosh. so again, more or less give me an ultimate. He says, Chris, you don't stop this. It's gonna You'll you. not be here when you're 40, all right? And I'm going to be 40 next, or this year, sorry, right? So I <laughs> started looking at other other avenues and, and what to do. And one of the things that, that, again, from the work ethic with my dad and my brother, whenever I used to close the body, oh, yes, I'm tapping the thing. Whenever I used to close the body shop for a couple of weeks at Christmas, a couple of weeks during the um, middle of the year, I would go and work in the shop to help them out. Right. So he had the tailors. Did he find yes. it? Yes, he found it himself. Yes, Dad's oh. been in that game since 1967. Well, was. He's a retired now. Since 1967, 68. So 50 odd years, you know. And um, yes, so I used to, I would work there in my weeks off. So I never stopped. I never took weeks off. If I was closing my own business, I went to work in the family business, right? And I always fought against it. And I always kind of, it was always going to be what I was supposed to do, Sarah. But you know, sometimes when you're young and you're told, that's the family business, get you in, get a suit on, sell suits and you'll, be, you'll live happily ever after. I was like, do you know what? No, I'm going to do something different. I want to, I want to, I want to put body kits on cars, right? Totally. So I did that. It is that thing. And it I was, think yes. especially in Northern Ireland, no one's going to tell me. What no one's going to tell me. I'm not just going to fall into that. But then as, as time went on, Sarah, you know, I was growing up. Um, I was getting married. I started to have different outlooks on life. I was starting to dress better. The whole inference on tailoring and suits was starting to get more popular because at the time when I was growing up, it was just an old man. It was just a man's thing, you know, that you wore going to work, whatever. All of a sudden, sudden, my age group were starting to dress better. And I'm thinking, mm-hmm. I could make an impact on this industry. Mm-hmm. And you know what? It's there. My dad is going to be retiring soon, okay, because he was you know, he's getting to that sort of point. But I then just had to... Um, have a chat with my brother because my brother was then partner in there for 15 years he maybe didn't want his wee younger brother coming in even though I'd been in the business world for quite a bit oh he's decided he wants to join oh, now, here. oh he? I hear now he wants to join the business you know so uh, there was a diff- couple of difficult conversations but we got there and worked out payments and stuff like that because you know what he didn't just want to step into it but um, yeah and it's worked out really well and one of the things they did tell me sir at the time was look this business isn't broke Christopher so don't try and fix it right and to be fair, for about the first two years of the business, Sarah, I sat back and I learned. I'm, I'm, a very, I'm very balanced that way. I don't think I know it all. In fact, I think I know not a lot. And I'm willing to learn. And I was not big back then. And I sat back for two years. And I sucked a lot of stuff in. And I started to work out ways that I could maybe add value to the business and maybe start to fix it, even though it wasn't broken. Mm-hmm. Because the industry was changing. But we as a business maybe just weren't changing quick enough with it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's when I get into the bespoke tailoring side. Okay, mm-hmm. and learned how to do all that and do all the design, all the measuring, and that. And where did you learn that? You can we learn there's a, there's a place in London, so mm-hmm. I'm back and forward to London. That's not Savile Row, but okay, it's, it's in London. Say, that was it's Golders Green direction, right? Yeah. And you can go back and forward, and um, you can just read. You can pick up the industry over over a, a number of times. Number one, I knew about tailoring. I knew about the men's game. I knew how to measure someone for a suit. I knew about the industry. I just had to learn the more um, intricate. Um, ways of fitting people in suits and changing the geometry of a suit to make it fit people better wow. and all that sort of stuff. And then the actual background behind the making of the stuff so that you can make better decisions on how to tell your workshop to make it, okay? So we did that. And again, I kind of did that behind the boys' back because they didn't want to get into it. Like, Chris, no, we used to do that years ago. It didn't work. And I was like, it's going to work. So right. I kind of learned that behind the scenes while it was still at work, right? And that's fine. Clever. So then I opened the... The, the brand called the Belfast Taylor, which is the bes- which was then the bespoke side of it, which, by the way, was a, a, a friend of yours, mm-hmm. a friend of ours even, Wendy Austin. 
when they coined that phrase for me, because I used to do, as you know, I do lots of radio stuff. And I, back then, because I was a young business person and very much involved in the city and the chambers and all that sort of stuff, Wendy used to bring me on to her show all the time and introduce me as, it's Chris Souter, the Belfast Taylor. And I was like, Wendy, that's, that's a one. flipping great name. Isn't so, Wendy great? She's so she's fabulous. Oh, so, you know, obviously, um, if anybody doesn't know, uh, Wendy, of course, worked for BBC Northern Ireland for yes. many, many years and is still doing fantastic things, but has always been fabulously encouraging totally. of young people and, and yes, new and people she, and yes, nurture. And she would have got me on specifically because of that, you know, that age that I was and, yeah. and the the passion and stuff. And she was really good to me, you know, and getting my name out there on, on radio and stuff. So, so the Wendy, Belfast Taylor was Wendy Austin? It was Wendy Austin, yeah. Monica. So, yeah, she hasn't sent me a bill yet, which is great. <laughs> um, so we started doing that and honestly then the floodgates opened whenever the whole influencer thing started kicking off there. So social media was still quite in its infancy back then. Okay, you had Bebo and you had Facebook coming through, but there were, Instagram was really only starting to kick off. And um, I seen true value in putting our clothing onto our sports stars. Because over here, in, there, there was no such thing as influencers back then. It was our sports stars and celebrities. This podcast is sponsored by Granite Legal Services, a niche business and immigration law practice located in the heart of Newry City. Granite Legal Services provides legal advice to both individuals and companies alike across a wide range of industries, from employment, commercial or corporate law matters to immigration law. Granite Legal Services focuses on providing legally sound, practical advice to its clients. To get in touch, visit www.granitelegalservices.co.uk or contact 028 3026 2200. So I started putting um, clothes on our sports stars, Michael Conlon, and then Carl Frampton. Then all of a sudden, once you start getting suits on Carl Frampton, because Carl was then starting to be at the height of his career, mm-hmm. huge, and the pre- the whole boxing dressed up in suits, we started out, we kind of kick-started that over here. Right. And all of a sudden, every boxer wanted to be wearing a suit in a press conference instead of a tracksuit. And that just got our name out there, sir. And so see here's what's the thing, though. Yeah. I'm thinking of your brother and your dad at that point. Yes. You want to give free suits to people, yes. Chris. What kind of a waste of money oh, is this? my goodness. Because, do you know what? Back then, sir, we had no marketing budget. Our shop ran on word of mouth. Literally word of mouth. And all of a sudden, I have all these other very successful business associates telling me, Chris, you got to market. Say, word of mouth is great. But word of mouth will not last forever. And I was like, you know what? Army business has been there for 30 years. We're we're back then 20. Um, We're doing okay. But like, Chris, if you do, if you get yourself out there a wee bit more, where do you see it first? And it's like, right, how am I going to do that? Do we buy, you know, advertising the Ulster Tatler, the Belfast, all that standard stuff. And I was like, no, I'm going to give Frampton a suit. And I'm going to get him to go out there on his Instagram, tell everybody that my suits are great. And where do you see what happens? And right enough, Sarah, it blew up. See the minute, Michael Conlon was my first. Michael Conlon had just won the, um, the Olympic um, Amateur Championship and came to see, we dressed him for an RT event. Carl then seen Michael looking really sharp, phoned me up, got my number from somewhere, phoned me up, Chris, can you flip and suit me out? Yes. And then see once Carl, and I, I owe a lot to Carl, and like he's a really good friend of mine, and he probably, probably listens because he loves his podcast. Um, we owe a lot to Carl. Carl put us on a, on a world stage. Is that right? And, and honestly, then so, so dad and brother at this oh, point go, okay, these like, days may be onto something. Yes, and that's all. And to be fair to the boys too, they, you know, they understood that, look, I was, I was being 29, I knew a bit. You know, I wasn't the wee 17, 18 year old kid trying to, print, trying to paint cars and make a living. So they kind of gave me a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a run at it. And that's where the, the business just, and since then, so like, they, they gave you numbers, uh, d- turn, um, double the turnover within four years for me Gosh. starting. Like, that's amazing. I'm very proud of that. You know, this is a business that was there for 20 and a very reputable business in Belfast that, you know, was told don't broke, it's, or it's not broke, so don't fix it. Mm-hmm. We doubled the turnover in four years. So if anybody's listening to this right now and they're still maybe a bit dubious about the whole marketing space and yeah. you know rightly so it's now if maybe i've just become much more aware but i think lots of people are seeing the influencers everywhere and yeah. you know these like oh look i'm wearing this makeup today i'm wearing this dress today and you know i love this so much and you think you're being paid yeah. to say that yeah so you know I'm, t- I'm, t- I'm i'm i go back to to sort of my my journalism training and you, you weren't allowed to take any freebies i used to yes. read the news every day but i had to buy my own <laughs> my own suits i wasn't allowed that that was literally you could not be paid for anything that you were seen to be promoting yes 
that's still the same, I it suppose, is, for the BBC. But for yes. a lot of people, it's these new people that have come about. Maybe not just the celebrities. Well, it's, it's people it's, who've yes. uh, started a whole career. So that's where it is. In fact, I would nearly even say, like, inf- on the influence... If you, I hate that word, but it is a word. It's, it, it's, is it's, a word. it is what it is, right? It is really on, the influencer, um, on the influencer market, right... The, like the celebrities, the, the the standard traditional celebrities are almost now second tier to the ones with the huge social media, the big YouTubers, the big Instagrammers, that sort of stuff. They get more traction than a lot of the celebs do, and that then in turn then technically creates celebrity for them. Do you know what I mean? So, would you count yourself as an influencer now? Well, <coughs> I, I said that in the introduction. Yes, and yes, I would. And to be fair, professionally, yes, I get paid to promote things. I get paid to go to hotels. I get paid to. Um, for to go out for dinner and, all, and and here I pay my tax on it so it is uh-huh. it's on my resume as a profession do you feel like you have to have that you know I have to justify all the time if people are well, talking to me do you feel that there's a negative vibe from people who don't perhaps understand what you do don't yes. see it as a proper job oh well there is because there's, 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 there's a guy on my Instagram last night literally give me hell for leather about my freebies right. about all the freebies and stuff but what that guy maybe doesn't see is that over the past five six seven years the work that has went into building my profile online sure. to be able to get to this level where people watch my stories every day, thousands of them, yeah. and take value from that. And if they know that if I promote something, I'm promoting it. I'm, I'm one of those honest influencers. See if it's crap, Sarah. I want nothing to do with it. I have a reputation. I have businesses. If you notice, all my business have my surname on them. So it's not like I can hide behind a name. No. Everything that I touch has suitor written on it. So from an influencer perspective, they know that if I'm promoting it, it's good. And yeah. do you have, is there a requirement now that you have to say this is promote? This is yeah, you have to do gifted ad, or, yeah. Um, or uh, yeah. Yeah. Is you hashtag gifted or hashtag right. ad or yeah. mm-hmm. it depends. Gifted is g- generally means that somebody's gifted it to you and there's no payment out of it. It's actually the product is the payment. Mm-hmm. Ad is generally what you have to, hashtag ad is what you have to put on if you're getting paid for it. So that's kind of a. So how does it work? So do you get a lot of gifts through the post and you think, I can't promote this? And what do you do? Well, do you say thanks to, very much? See, to be fair, send sir, it back? Sir, I'll be honest, with you, I've really only had that maybe twice or three times. Most of the stuff that's came through, it's been like a lot of stuff, a lot of people know where I am in the shop, right? In Belfast. And they'll, excuse me, they'll, they'll send me stuff to the shop. And you know what? I just want to help them. Mm-hmm. And like there is no payment in a lot of it, yeah. you know, and I'm happy enough to promote it and put it out there and show all my people that all the people that watch me what it is. And like the amount of businesses that have then sent me a thank you and stuff like that and, and, and seen their business increase and even flourish because it's been me that's kind of kickstarted them off. It's great. So depending on what hat you've got on or what mindset you've got on about yeah. it, it can be a really healthy um, way to help other entrepreneurs. Um, totally. And, you know, when you look at the whole Insta space, it's so positive, it's so fantastic. It's really hard work, though, too, isn't it? And yeah. there's a very dark side, is there? Well, there's there's a, trolls out there. Well, there's, uh, yeah. yeah, I was getting trolled again last night. Right. Of all, yeah, man, I get not. I don't get it as often as I used to because now I generally just delete people and don't even get it. But I did get into a little bit of a spot last night. I don't know what got into me, mm-hmm. but I just thought, you know what, this guy's a flipping anyway. Mm-hmm. And usually, I would just delete them and carry on because it's everywhere. But but, that, but it is. It it must take its toll. It's great when it's great. Yeah. And then you know the the classic thing with with negative comments or negative yeah. feedback. You you know there's so much of it is brilliant, but the the one person that says something. Yeah. And your whole mood and your whole world can shatter. It's when it gets personal, Sarah. Like there's been times where people into and it's got really personal. But how do you? I mean, you've, you've got you've got young girls, daughters as well. Well, yeah, you know you're a family man, and they're savvy too. too. You know they'll be and internet they, savvy, and they'll be getting more internet savvy. Yeah, and if they are aware of any toxicity or any yeah. negative comments, have you thought about that? Do you talk to yeah, them about I'm, no, that? No, I've already now I've dropped it in kind of lightly with them, and they know that daddy's out there in front of uh, me Instagram and all the rest. They see all the TV stuff and all the just all the stuff that I do. They understand. I just there's people out there that don't really like daddy. And you know what? They say awful things, even us, but it is what it is. And they know that I'm comfortable with it, which will then make, hopefully, which will then make them comfortable with it. At the scene that it it kind of got to me and got me down, which, which it, to be fair, sir, it doesn't. Good. I'm bigger than that now. It used to, because I try to be as nice a guy as I can every day. Yep. You know, I'm not one of those guys that goes out there to try and rob people and, you know, and, and just, and then it's nasty. I have not a nasty bone in my body, sir, Travers. <laughs> and that's what kind of gets me whenever people don't know me and jump to a conclusion, tar me with another person's brush. 
I'm like, that's not me. Do you know well, what I mean? Why, it. You know, it, it, and that's if only you met me, you'd know. How do you rise above all of that yes. all the time? And how do you keep positive? Because I know me as a, 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 um, somebody who was in the public eye yeah. a lot when I was a newsreader. We didn't have social media to yes. the same extent. Yes. And the couple of negative comments, I really struggled with that. Yeah. And I know that, you know, some of them were just horrendous awful and yeah. even my late father at the time would take massive offense and you know my kids would be aware of stuff and I thought I need to step back from this I don't like the way the world's going but yeah what needs to be done to make sure that Ava and Lois your little girls and uh, and everybody else you know stays stays safe and that we can believe and trust yeah and see the good and, and use social media for yeah good resilience is something that I think in our kids we have lost We've been too, over the last generation, we've been too worried about kids knowing what's bad in the world. And all of a sudden you lose that resilience to them. Something does go wrong and they come up against some sort of adversity. They don't have the tools to deal with it. That's life. That's life. Yeah, whereas like even, there was a guy, um, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, big, huge podcast. You know, my my favourite podcaster, right? He apart put up, from me. Apart from Sarah Travis. <laughs> and he put up, and Shane Todd, love Shane Todd. Oh, yeah. And he put up um, a thing on Instagram last night of this Russian or Ukrainian um, guy in the first, Second World War. And it was a picture of him in 1941 and then a picture of him in 1945. 41, young kid, 17, 18 year old. He got, um, he got put in a concentration camp and um, literally just driven through hell for two years. Came out of it, got back into the army. Finished his thing with the army in four years, and he looked 45, 50 year old, you know, within two or three oh, years. Wow. But he went on to lead a great life. And I'm just thinking, you know, that's the resilience that was in that generation, our father's generation. You bring it to now, like we were told, Sarah, a year ago to stay in and right. play your PlayStation and watch TV for a couple of months, and most of us couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. You know, the resilience, resilience yeah. in our generation has been lost. Because true adver- we we have never really had true adversity. So I'm trying to not that I'm not that I'm trying to depress my kids or anything, like but I'm, I try to be very fair with them and teach them about what's went on in the world before. And again, bring that get that work ethic into them and almost try and teach them that little bit of resilience so that if it ever does come up, sir, and my kids read something about daddy, they'll just go, That guy there, my dad doesn't care about him and just carry on. And you know, instead of going, Oh, look what he's saying about my poor daddy. Yeah. Like daddy's daddy's got this. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. bit of resilience is it's it's gonna go a long way. Crucial and we have, you know, wrapped up the kids in cotton wool because I think we're so aware of what a scary place the world is. But yeah. you're you're totally right. We need to we need to do something so that they can cope and don't crumble. Yes, exactly. And like here, you yeah. could get well into it and go overboard on I'm just trying to give my kids enough tools that whenever the world hits them up the face, which will happen to us all, that they do have that bit of resilience. Because I was brought up that way, sir. You know, I, I wasn't molly cuddled. I was brought up, this is the way it is. Mm-hmm. This is what's out there. You can choose to either suck it in or not. But Chris, this is how you get on my life. That's the best so, way. Okay, yeah. let's go back to the doubling of the turnover yeah. with um, your reaching out and getting celebrity endorsement. You've dressed an awful lot of celebrities. You've I talked know. about the numbers, but yeah. are you allowed to name drop a little more? Because I do remember the whole li- <laughs> line of duty. Oh, yeah. I'll Did you do that. Yeah, yeah. I was in it. Oh, you were in it. I was in it for 1.5 seconds, extra. Sarah Travers. I was in line of duty. So, how many Class. suits did you have to, to give away? Well, <laughs> well, no, no, that's all. That's all. No, that's all paid for. That's yeah. yeah I, I did, that's a that's a proper professional wow. contract. Wasn't with that amazing? Amazing, and that came through Jed. It actually came through came through UFC. I went to Belfast UFC. Was sitting beside Martin Comston, right in the what he called at at the event. Steve Arnott. Steve Arnott. Me and him just got chatting. He came to me the next week, dressed him up for I think it was a Jimmy Carr show or something. He's going on to. He then sent Jed Mercurio in. Yep. Got Jed dressed with us in season two. And it took Jed from season two to season six to get me into it. And it was one of those ones, Jed, he kept promising me, he says, Chris, I'm going to get you in this season. And then I never got the phone call. And then, you know, I never... So what, you're sitting out you're in a cafe or something? You're yes, I'm in a in cafe. Room. I know, it's just dead funny. And um, then season six came around. I was like, Chris, this is... I was like, Chris, this could be the last season. I'm getting you in. I was like, Jed, look, man, if it happens, great. If it doesn't, it's just been great crack doing this for you for years, you know. Um, and no, he did. He made the phone call, and that was me. And I got my wee, my wee scene in it. It's oh funny. my goodness! I know. And what was it like working with the guys? Because I know Jed Mercurio is is incredible, amazing, a, a brilliant writer, producer, director. Yeah. Um, but you know, Line of Duty really. I mean, it's huge. And yeah. It really put Belfast on the map. What totally. did it do for business? Did, did oh great! Like, see, from Martin Comston particularly, like, we we still have people come to us 
because of Martin Compson. Right. He is huge. Uh -huh. And particularly a lot of Scottish people would come up because we make DSR it suits, uh -huh. you know, that we come. So um, What about Adrian Dunbar? Did you dress him too? 80, well, I've met Adrian, but we didn't. Uh, he was always in um, police wear. Police wear. Yeah, yes, so we didn't do anything for him, but uh, Adrian's lovely. Yeah. Um, and the rest, like Stephen, all their, their other kind of co-stars, like Stephen Graham, he was great. Like, he's he's a Hollywood massive, star. Massive. Oh, if that made him get up. We're still, you know, very friendly um, on the phone and stuff. Like, and he's just, he's just, oh, he's just a legend. The people that I've met, even just through Line of Duty, has been class. But, like, with regards to the whole celebrities, um, with, with the suits, like, every sports star you can imagine over here, I do their suits. Right. All their TV stars, I do their suits. Do you know what I mean? It's great. And are you allowed to name drop a few more? Boxer-wise, you know, Frampton and Colin, um, Tyrone McKenna, Ryan Burnett, um, oh, cheapers! Rugby stars: Tommy Bow, Stevie Ferris, um, Rory Rory Best. Rory Best. So Rory Best has his own fitting room in our shop. What? Um, Michael Conlon has his own fitting room in our shop. And Jimmy. What? Nobody uh, else gets into them. No, as in like we've got a fitting room designated to them with all their gear, oh. right? Ram Burnett has a, his own fitting room. And um, Jonathan Ray, do you all Jonathan Ray stuff? Jonathan Ray and I would be very good friends. Now over the whole thing, and he's just he's as you know, John's amazing. Um, and we Carl, Carl, as you know, has he's he's got my office, so Carl's stuffs all in the office. Um, and what do your dad and your brother make of all this? And and I mean, you know, the whole vibe, you, you, somebody comes into the shop, you yep. get the photograph. You do, it, it's it's a real buzz around. It's cl yeah. it's cl it is classic. Van Morrison do all van stuff. Right. Um, Brian Kennedy make brand stuff. Um, let me see, I do whatever the the band stuff. I dress Westlife and all that sort of stuff. Really? Yeah, it's class. Excuse me. Um, let me see. Flip it goes on across the water. Snooker players. I do Ronnie O'Sullivan stuff. Um, and Mark how does Allen. It work? Does some? Oh my goodness! Right. So loads. Yeah, of people. like loads do, of people. Do you find that it's maybe? Do they have a stylist? That they've got a shoot coming up, and do yeah. they? Does the stylist they, come to you, or does it come yes. directly? Yes. No. But generally, the stylist will come to you. I work with a lot of different stylists, and if they maybe can't be there on the night to dress some of the bands and stuff like that, they give me a shout. And I, I help them out. And, you know, it, that works. That's a, that's a nice wee relationship I have there, you know. And sometimes they would buy a lot of my stuff. Sometimes they buy a lot of stuff from elsewhere. And I would then clear it together and, and get the guys looking really, really sharp. And looking really sharp is what you do best. Yes. What makes a really good suit? And obviously people come in all different shapes and sizes. Yeah. When somebody walks in and said, help me out, Chris, make me look sharp and yeah. fantastic what are you doing for Sir, them? What it's are you difficult because sometimes guys come in and they'll, <laughs> they'll come in with a picture of David Beckham and they'll show me Bex and they'll go Chris I want to look like that <laughs> and I'm looking at them going do you know I'm a tailor but I don't Not have a, a magic wand <laughs> yes so I know really it's just about it's a, number one it's about it's about the fit is the most important thing Sarah and after that it's colour so it's making sure that you don't put certain colours on people that will maybe drain their colour or clash with their hair or, and you get them into garments that fit their body shape well like for some people if they're quite square in the shoulders you want to put on a suit that maybe doesn't have a lot of padding mm -hmm. otherwise if they're quite narrow and dropping the shoulders you want to put on a suit that has a shoulder pad that squares them up mm -hmm. so again it's about widening the shoulders narrowing the waist and having a nice taper on the leg and that goes across the casual wear and then the tailoring side it's all about silhouettes it's all about trying to use the shape and how we cut the suits and shape the suits and the jackets and all the other clothes to make the person's silhouette better and, and can you I mean even yes oh you can yeah maybe the covid pounds etc yeah that we've got the little paunch etc how, how do you can like even, you yeah. mask that and disguise well, that with a good suit little tricks with that is see with regards to, let's talk about the suit jacket if the guy has a bit of a tummy we'll maybe cut the jacket slightly short so it doesn't button Right, mm -hmm. so it sits neater to their tummy. Then we'll angle the pockets. We'll put on the pocket at maybe a 35 or a 45 degree angle. Cut the waist ever so slightly neat at the back. Therefore, when somebody looks at them straight on, their silhouette has that nice hourglass shape, which takes your eyes away from the belly, which is class. You know, that is, it's all the illusion. It's illusion, yeah. yeah. Now, if the guy's really, really slim and maybe once built out, they say that's from maybe pat up the shoulder, maybe square out the waist, maybe straighten up the pockets, and that gives that person then a more square filled out look. So you are so, a magician, really. Well, yes, when it comes to the tailoring side of things, yes, there are certain things you can do to make people look so much better, but the fit, and that's what I concentrate on, the fit is the most per, per, the most important thing because you could bring me, you could go and buy a five grand Tom Ford suit and put it on and you'll look like you're wearing a bin bag. Really? Whereas, Be off the peg. Thing. Yes, you could come to me and buy a bin bag and I'll cut it apart and make it look amazing on you. Do you know? But you still, I mean, it's still not cheap, is it? It's still not cheap to get a good suit. Yeah, well, the bespoke, yeah. Yeah. the bespoke stuff, you know, it can be 800, 900,000 pounds, even if we've done suits at two and three grand before. 
Now, our ready-to-wear stuff is that is the better value stuff from sort of 200 to 500. But even with ready-to-wear stuff, stuff that's ready-made, Sarah, with a good eye and a good tailor, we can adjust it to make it, you might not have it perfect, but you can have it a whole lot better. And it's that's where we angled our game. Other shops are just kind of out there to sell you the clothes. Get the clothes into the customer's bag, take the money. We're like, stop, this is our name. You're in Suter Brothers. This is our gig. We need to put our stamp on it. Let's taper that trouser. 10 mil at the bottom. Let's let out the jacket a little bit there. Let's take the shoulder up a bit. Let's shorten the sleeve. Let's narrow the sleeve. And all of a sudden, see when you pin it up on the guy and he looks himself in the mirror mm. with the, the suit fitted our way compared to what it would have been in another shop, which is just, there's the suit. He's like, I'll have two of them. <laughs> Truth. Get me another one. Get me it in black. <laughs> you feel great. Yes. And it's like, they're thinking, this guy has taken time and effort to make me look the best I can look. And like that's, you get so much buy-in with that, Sarah. People then, you make a customer out of them. Sorry, you make a friend out of them. Mm. And that's what makes the them trust, come back. Trust, you say, and because you've, yes. you've taken the time and you've you've worked with them and it is bespoke. And it's not just a transaction. No. Do you know what I mean? It's a relationship. It's not just, there's the suit, thanks very much for the money, see you later. And, you know, the whole uh, looking good industry, um, you know, men have totally bought into totally. that as well now. Yep. And it does add to maybe the brand or... Yep. Um, you know, what you want to put out there when you've got to make an effort. What's happened through COVID, though, when everybody's been wearing right. elasticated waists? Well, we're, st- we're still in that at the minute. Whereas, Has yeah. that affected business? Oh, traffic? totally. Oh, yeah. Sarah, business. Now, whenever we open back up again there in 2021, the wedding, the um, the backed up wedding trade floated our industry, so including our shop. So the weddings that weren't able to take to go ahead, um, that's what kind of was floating the business so through. So was that a massive challenge? Is that why oh, you look time. to the coffee? And oh, yes, other way? Right, it's okay. why I've expanded into other areas. So Number one, I just love a challenge. It's not like I get bored very quickly, but I just like doing stuff. I like when, see if somebody tells me, sir, I can't do something, or that you shouldn't do it. I'm the guy that's like, I'm going to flip and work out a way to do it just to prove this guy wrong. So, What's been the biggest <coughs> challenge you faced? Biggest challenge in life or in business? This is about business really, isn't it? Well, you could tell us either. Oh, there's oh, there's plenty of Sometimes life stories. Sometimes there's an overlap. Yeah, we don't have enough. I don't think we have enough time. No, we're um, and we're over already. Mm-hmm. Um, let me see. The biggest challenge in business. Well, at the very start, it was it was getting my brother particularly um, to let me have a go at doing what I wanted to do within the business. And he like he's very he's very um, let me see what's the word complimentary to it now. And like he knows what we've done because the business itself. Um, our Sharon is in his wife is our main alteration tailor. And the, the, because of how the business has went, you know, the both of them are now earning way more money than they would have been if, if I didn't come into the business. So, um, yeah, that was that was difficult at that time. But you've learned real skills in, t- in terms of um, diplomacy and bringing people together yes. and making them see it as a win-win rather than yes. I win and you lose. Correct. And that's yes. the thing, sir. It's about bringing people together with you. You can't mm. be a one-man band. And no. Generally, even in any business, you got to always have a team or somebody around you. But, um, so yeah. you'll continue doing the coffee, you'll yeah. continue the DJing, or how's yeah. oh, that going? DJing, oh, brilliant. We'll so get back dancing soon. Yeah, 2019. go dancing. Well, now here's the thing, 2019, sir, I just decided one day, a guy came into me who owned a club in, um, in Bangor, Michael Brennan, and I had been doing my motivational videos every morning on my Instagram, overlaying it with some music. People were going, Chris, can you send me a playlist? And I was like, I don't have a playlist. I, I just, tuned in. I was yes. bopping away. Do you know what I mean? I, just, I, just, <laughs> I don't have a playlist. I just like my music. And um, me and him got talking and they said that I was going to become a DJ. And he put me on a bill. Two weeks, Sarah. Two weeks, I had to find decks, music, headphones, speakers, learn how to do it. Are you serious? I you am didn't serious. Do that before then? No. I had no idea. About Two that. weeks I learned to be a DJ okay. and since then, so like see over lockdown, I was one, or, uh, sorry, once lockdown finished there, I was probably one of the busiest professional DJs in the country. Okay. I was out four nights a week. And you're only one man and yet you're doing all of these yes, different things. Yes, there's plenty of time in the day. Well, listen, we've, we've, we have completely run over time, but I want to ask you one final question, Mr. Biggie. Which celebrity would you love to dress? <gasps> oh, right. Dead easy. McElroy. Because he was supposed, Michael, I've known Rory for 10 years. And every time I see him, which isn't that often nowadays, it's Chris, I'll come in, I'll definitely come in and I'll get a suit. And it's like, Rory, you're the one that I'm missing. Out of all the enormous football, like I do all the Northern Ireland team. Do you know what I mean? So I do, I do, I do all the rugby. I do, out of all the professional sports people that I have in my shop, McElroy's the one I'm missing. What so would you put him in? Do you know what? Rory's quite a sharp dress. What do you mean that he doesn't generally wear stuff that, that, that is outlandish? 
So again, he looks really, he wears black and greys all the time. He looks really good. Navy's his colour. I'd put him in a nice separate look, maybe a navy jacket with a nice grey trouser, maybe the maybe light blue check in it. Okay. Plain shirt, little quarter zip. That's Rory's look, or maybe even a wee card eight with the, the five button. Just something really, really sharp. Yeah, yeah. by the way, you think of it, there's, you can look up something on the net. 2016, was it, or 2015, Rory McIlroy went into um, Old Trafford wearing a checked suit. Do you remember that? When he had just won the US Open, right? I'm sure. I'll look it up. Right, look it up. And I was, and literally the media slated him. Like, it was horrendous. Like, oh. tore him to bits, right? And I was brought on for BBC UK as, like, the commentator about it. And I was talking about how it was nice, right? And since then, that's only 20, that's only either 20, I think it's 2015. That's only six years ago now, Sarah. Now, every shop in the country, in the UK, has checked suits. Well, there you go. It's not that long ago that it's... Look at what I'm wearing today. You're wearing... It's you're not looking that, very dapper Yes, today. thank you. It's not that long ago that a suit like this was frowned upon. It's only five or six years ago. Mm. And there you go, McElroy. He was a trendsetter. He's back. He was a trendsetter. Uh, of course, Rory will be listening to this podcast he today. So you know where to go to get your Come on, Rory. Suited it and booted experience. <laughs> no better place than uh, Suter Brothers. Chris, it's been an absolute joy talking to you today. Thanks, One yeah, final question, because nope. the purpose of this podcast is to inspire business owners and ambitious entrepreneurs out there to perhaps start up or grow their business yes. by offering an insight into the success of businesses such as Suter Brothers, what is the one nugget that you would give to people today, especially if they have an idea, but they don't know where to begin? Right, well, I'm not allowed to swear in this room, I'm not. No, right, so a few times, but we'll delete we'll use We'll use flipping, right, which is just flipping, go for it. And that is, honestly, that sounds so generic and so easy, but see if you can get your mindset into that, that I just have to go for it. What can you lose, Really? You know what? A lot of people are maybe scared of the financial side of it, but you can always make more money. There's always another way. Pluck up the courage to just go for it. Because at the end of the day, what is the worst that can happen? And you know, until you do it, you don't know. So that's my, my one nugget. It's just, and that's one thing, Sarah, like with regards to even like the coffee recently there, you know, the amount of people that tried to talk me out of it. And I just, myself, my wife and Anna, our chef partner, we have just went for it and it's working out really well. So oh, you just don't know. You, but yeah, and uh, unless you go and do it, you're not going to know. Exactly. So Exactly. You have been a breath of fresh air. Thanks, Sarah. Chris Suter, thank you so Pleasure. much for joining us on the Public Eye podcast. This podcast was recorded in Granite Podcast Studio. Interested in starting up your own podcast but don't know how? Granite Podcast Studio can help. Record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio, which is based in the heart of Newry City. Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.